So let's begin then. And the first panel is on Jenny Diskey and life writing, and it's going to be chaired by Professor Elika Boomer, whom I'm delighted to welcome. She's a professor of world literature in the English faculty at Oxford, and she's also the director of the Oxford Centre for Life Writing, which is based at Wilson College. As anyone who works in post-colonial world literature knows, Professor Bomer is a founding and leading figure in those fields, and she's also an eminent novelist and short story writer. Her current project is entitled Southern Imagining, and Disky's Skating to Antarctica is actually going to feature in that. So I'll hand over to Elika then to chair this first panel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ben. Can you hear me? Yes? Um, I'm assuming so. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction and, uh, and most of all, really, for um, putting together this, uh, this, this wonderful uh, conference and recognition of, of Disky's uh, amazing work. It's a great privilege uh, for me to, um, to be present and, and to participate and also to introduce uh, the first session. Um, in which we're looking at uh, Disky's life writing. Um, I'm a, I've been for decades really a, a, a great fan and admirer of Disky's work um, and, uh, and Skating to Antarctica is uh, particularly um, a, a shaping force in, in some current work that I'm doing as, as Ben was saying. And I know that uh, this same book has been hugely influential also for uh, the two speakers. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce the two speakers in the order in which they appear in the program. I'll introduce Joanna first and she'll speak and then likewise for Guntoran. Um, so without further ado, um, it's my very great pleasure to uh, introduce Joanna Price, who teaches English and American literature at the university as at Liverpool John Moores University, which is which is uh, here in, 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 in the UK. She has written about affect and place, particularly in relation to trauma, memory, and mourning. She's also published articles on memory and emotion in Jenny Diskey's work. And, her, and Diskey's book, Skating to Antarctica, inspired Joanna's current research into how Antarctic places became affective in life writing and other cultural forms. And uh, I've heard Joanna speak before on the Scott hut in Antarctica and the affect with which its walls and, and objects are loaded. So I'm really excited uh, to hear her talk today. Thanks so much, Joanna. Uh, thank you very much for um, having me here today to talk about Jenny Diskey, who's, whose work I, I've loved for, for many years. Um, and as Elika said, introducing me, this paper is part of my current research into the embodied experience of, of place and how literary representations of that experience create effective spaces in the cultural imagination. My exploration of this topic began with reading Disky's Skating to Antarctica. In this paper, I'll look at how Disky writes about the relationship between body, mind and place, and how her analysis of that relationship develops in, in gratitude. Just, there we are. Um, in her final work, In Gratitude, Jenny Diskey considers an author's note Doris Lessing wrote in The Sweetest Dream. I am not writing volume three of my autobiography because of possible hurt to vulnerable people, which doesn't mean I have novelised autobiography. There are no parallels here to actual people, except for one, a very minor character. Diskey comments, the passage is a kind of labyrinth not to hurt vulnerable people. They must be real, they must be alive, or why bother with it? She reflects that she might be one of the vulnerable people to whom Lessing alludes, or the person upon whom the very minor character is based. Enrage her and arouse feelings of betrayal, abandonment and disempowerment. 
as she wonders what judgments are being made about whom. These judgments hover in Lessing's disingenuousness about genre crossings. Discomfort around the obfuscation of genre is unusual in Disky's work. For her own writing, she prefers freedom from the laws and limits of genre. She dislikes the idea of being a travel writer and introduces on trying to keep still with the observation that this is not a travel book, though it contains some journeys. It's a book on travelling and keeping still. Primarily, it's about the wish to keep still. She also finds autobiography restrictive. Even though in her writing, I start with me and often enough end with me, she needs something else, some other component in the narrative than just my personal history. But the generic inclusiveness of memoir allows Disky to explore her past and present experience of self through her encounters with diverse other people and things from Antarctica to cancer. Open as memoir is to adaptation and heterogeneity though, Disky is very precise about the elements that comprise writing in any genre. My story, someone else's story, a place, an idea, a dream, human anatomy, the mind acting on the world. <clears throat> in her memoirs, she examines the relationship between these elements, especially between body, feeling, mind and place. In On Trying to Keep Still, Disky reflects on her thought processes as she's holed up alone in a cottage in the Quantux. <clears throat> her models for productive contemplation in solitude are Montaigne, Coleridge and Beckett. By comparison with them, she observes, all my mind could manage apart from acknowledging the effects of the physical world on me and my shifting mood were chattering. Disheartened as she recalls feeling, Disky's reflection tracks very precisely the connections between thinking and feeling, mood and cognition that occur through memory. These feelings may appear to reveal some connected narrative, some series of events and responses that fed into the being you had become. But what you thought you see fades and is forgotten or ungraspable. Through her contemplation across her memoirs of the, of the articulation of her mind with body and place, Disky traces the pattern, repetition, process that might amount to a sense of self or what she calls in skating, a continuum of me. Like Montaigne in his essays, she tries out different reflections on her embodied process of thinking and on the recurring objects of that process. Running through all her meditations on the embodied self is, as Disky suggests, an attention to the feeling of a moment, an encounter, an occurrence or a place. Her memoirs are dynamised by her reflection on certain feelings that she identifies in recurring and new scenes. Sylvan Tompkins in Shame and Its Sisters examines how affective experience develops through a person's life narrative. He suggests that specific scenes which have become affective for an individual are subject to psychological magnification and assembled and ordered to form a script. Quote, the script does not deal with all the scenes or the plot of a life, but rather with the individual's rules for predicting, interpreting, responding to and controlling a magnified set of scenes. Through her writing, Disky reflects on and interprets her own affective scenes and script. She dislikes writing narrative, preferring instead to think about things like the closed door that separated her and Doris Lessing on her arrival at Lessing's house, where her mother was to hand her over into Lessing's care. And you can see the full, full quote uh, describing that scene on the screen. Disky imagines herself and the kitten bearing Lessing on either side of the door, both of them anxious about who is on the other side and what will unfold from their encounter. Her attention to their breathing and to their efforts to compose their face suggests the effectiveness of the scene. 
these bodily microactions register feelings that in Disky's case recur through her recollection of scenes where Lessing has the power to decide whether to include or exclude her, not least by what she writes. These scenes resonate with other magnified scenes to which Disky returns in her memoirs, which also involve being locked out or excluded, abandoned, evicted, dispossessed and displaced. Through them, she recognises recurring feelings of melancholia and being cold, bereft and unhoped. The feelings that she traces in her memoirs arise initially through her embodied experience of place. Through her reflections, she elucidates the relationship between mood and the physical world. Despite her expressed preference for stillness, disembodiment and blankness, Disky's memoirs are attuned to movements, her body and the population of the spaces she occupies by her feelings. Through her self-scrutiny, she examines the connections between bodily stillness and movement and the propulsions of affect and emotion. The movement from feeling, an effective response to one's physical environment, to bodily and emotional state, is often spatially elaborated in Disky's recurring scenes and it structures her memoirs. The repetition of certain gerunds such as walking and falling as objects of contemplation throughout her memoirs contributes to the impression of an effective continuum or pattern running through her account of her life. It also helps create an aesthetics in which states of feeling inscribed by the body generate the recurring tropes of Disky's text and emotional landscape. Rumination on walking affords Disky a continuing thread of reflection on the connection between body and mind and on how the movement or stasis of feelings informs the disposition of the body and its interaction with its environment. In her first memoir, she compares walking with skating, the action that generates some of the book's dominant metaphors and establishes her investigation of the relationship between her past and the present and body, mind and feeling. She observes that because of the artifice of constraining one's foot in an ice skate and disciplining the body in skating, she can recover the memory and sensation of skating. In contrast, it's difficult to, to, to retrieve the memory of the walk she just made from the kitchen to her study. If she reenacts the walk, quote, trying to be fully aware of what it feels like, I lose the essence of walking, which is that it's an unthinking process. Bring back the sensation and I lose the reality of it. And yet, habituated as the act of walking seems, it becomes apparent later in skating that for Disky, walking outside the house is a defamiliarised activity in which bodily movement and sensation and the interaction of the body with the landscape are conductors of feelings that complicate her desire and ability to undertake it. She observes, I cannot recollect a time when the idea of going for a walk was not a torment to me. Later, in On Trying to Keep Still, Disky recalls her stay in the Quantux, an area Coleridge and Wordsworth had also visited. Mindful of the romantic tradition in which wandering through nature, thinking and writing go hand in hand, Disky recognises an imperative, a terrible morality, a literary morality at that to go for a walk like a proper writer. But the idea of walking without a destination is anathema to her and deliberation impedes each part of it. Walking is central to D Disky's memory of an effective scene that she alludes to in skating and retells in ingratitude. She recalls her first experience of a journey with no destination as her mother, who, feels who fears eviction by the bailiffs, tells her young daughter they're destitute and takes her out to walk the streets in the rain. We were wandering. It was raining. I remember the dark paint pavement, watching my feet walking, my head down, the splashing of the falling rain and for the first time being out and walking but without a destination. 
before that, if we went out, we were always going somewhere, if only to a shop and then to return home. This was quite new and terrifying. We were just walking, homeless, with nowhere to go. Disky's mother's words take on an effective charge that shapes her daughter's relationship, both to the act of walking and the environment through which she moves. Fear of abandonment, of having nowhere to go, of being bereft and unsheltered, create a script she recognises. She notices later, for example, how the sense of desolation she experiences as she walks along the beach in St Andrew's Bay, South Georgia, quote, chimed with something mournful inside me and causes tears belonging to another time. Attention to her feet and their performance in the act of walking recurs in Disky's memoirs. The presence of the physical in the psychic is intimated by her observation of how awareness of pain in her left foot caused by having Freiburg's disease has been her normal except in periods of relief after surgery. From the reflection on her foot in the ice skate that captures early memories of navigating her relationship with her mother in skating to Antarctica, through her observation in On Trying of how she's unable to reflexively walk and think as writers do. Disky's allusions to her feet show how the body is a living knot of significations, as Muller Ponty has put it, both as it's lived and as it's present in her texts. The exchange between psychical and physiological dispositions that Merleau Ponty notes is the subject of Disky scrutiny as she recalls the three minute walk that she repeated from the bus stop to Doris Lessing's flat over several years in the 1970s. She traces with absolute precision how the fear or abandonment that arrests her heart in response to Lessing's footnote and other verbal exclusions turns into rage, a feeling that begins with the sensation of her foot hitting the pavement. Her analysis of the movement from sensation to feeling at the same point on the walk over weeks and years reveals both a pairing of mind and body, as she notes, and an element of the pattern through which a feeling of self is glimpsed. A counterpoint to Disky's attention to movement and walking throughout her memoirs is her observation of the fear of falling that has delineated the spaces of her anxiety and depression from childhood onwards. Disky notes how, as she writes in Gratitude, her body insists in her everyday actions, her reflections and her writing process, as all her movements are fraught with the anticipation or experience of falling due to her cancer treatment. She also observes the presence of pain caused by a broken wrist as she reflects on the rapid transition of sensation in her foot to rage on her walk to Doris Lessing's flat. Just as pervasive Lokes mood to a feeling of fall in this book, it's present, for example, in her response to Doris Lessing's author's note. I can't get away from that paragraph. It feels like a well, bottomless, Time to hold your breath before you hear the distant splash of a coin somewhere down there. The vertiginous and projectile body is also intimated in Gerald Manley Hopkins' evocation of the depressed mind in the line that suddenly interrupts Disky's words. Over mind, mind has mountains, cliffs of fall. Anxiety and fear are, as Sean and Guy reminds us, expectant emotions that aim at the future disposition of the self. And Disky tells us, I am scared of dissolution, of casting my particles to the wind. A sense of falling also occurs as she reads or listens to Doris Lessing's words and responds to their effect on her sense of herself as a writer. Chloe Disky observes, I can imagine that happening and the dissolution as well as the determination that followed it. Writing against this dissolution, Disky has given us a richly generative account of how mind and body interact with each other and the world. Thank you. Thank you for listening.